Everybody, welcome back to our second session live from Jerusalem. I got to shift my camera from the last broadcast. Forgive me, folks. Oh, good lord! There we go. Let's just do that. Anyways, welcome back to the second session of Beyond the Seven live from Jerusalem with Rabbi Aaron David Poston, who I am fully enjoying. You know, he had our top video of the week with his first session. We were so excited. Uh, to see the hundreds and hundreds of people that actually tuned in and uh, checked out his message. Good, good uh, following time. It means a lot to us, but I know it means a lot to a wonderful rabbi who studies in order to share. And uh, so I'm not going to uh, beleaguer this any longer. I'm going to turn it over to Rabbi Poston. Rabbi, how are you today? We're so glad that you, you started this series Beyond the Seven, and we, we had some wonderful teaching last week, and we're looking forward to exactly what you want to share with us stage is yours rabbi thank you dan and thank you for all the uh listeners who have joined in now or have watched in the post-production it's um it's a pleasure to be here once again with you i want to say shavuoto for those i guess from europe and uh east eastward uh, people already in china might be awake and for those who are uh I guess in the middle of the night, I don't know if there are anybody, maybe in Hawaii, I don't know. But uh, for those in North America, I'll say Shabbat Shalom or Shavuot Tov, and um, I'm glad to be back. We actually had people inquire all the way from New Zealand, Rabbi. Uh, we had people uh, from uh, Indonesia last week. Uh, we had uh, questions from yeah all around the globe, not just here in the West in uh, I know we're joined right now by people in California. We got people uh, uh, here in British Columbia, Canada, and more so. Uh, we're eager to hear from learned rabbis, especially out of Israel. Um, I firmly believe in that connection with, uh, with, with Hashem, but through the nation of Israel and through Jerusalem, we, we, we believe great things are going to happen there. And who better than to share it than a lovely rabbi such as yourself there. Thank you. I just want to take one moment out. Just, we should, uh, have in mind to pray. For, um, for those who are suffering, I think the whole world is suffering on some level. Uh, but for those who are physically suffering uh, from the, this virus that is, is a pandemic and is affecting the whole world, that, that they should have a refuah shalem, a complete recovery. And, of course, this is also a prayer for all of us who are, many of us are suffering a second hand, you know, whether it's um, just from the, the panic, <laughs> the panic and the fear that we should have a, a greater trust in Hashem and uh, Bezrat Hashem that uh, at least the financial situation that either personally or the whole world will go on, there will certainly affect every one of us and it should uh, hopefully be a little bit smoother than, than we expect Bezrat Hashem. God's help. Okay, so I, I have some things I, I prepared. Um, I want to start off with um, mentioning my, my Rebbe, Rev Noah Weinberg, who unfortunately passed away, but uh, his words still live on. And one of the things that he taught us was whenever you get into a discussion, I would say even, I don't want to use the word argument, because that's usually what it is, though. You get into a discussion where you don't see eye to eye with somebody. If you take a little bit of time, okay, go deep into trying to define the words that you're actually talking about you may actually find that you don't disagree that much, or you're not to the extent that you think you are, you're, you're much closer. So it's very important to define words. Always when you're in, the, in any conversation where you find, oh, that doesn't really sound right. And do I hear, is this what you're saying, okay? And that's why I think, uh, I say I think, um, really believe strongly about what we call the Chavruta system. It's where two people are sitting and learning a text, and they're going to, it's called going back and forth, okay? I read, I translate, I try to explain, and the person on the other end will either totally agree, which is not a good situation, <laughs> because who's perfect, okay? He, he has a certain emphasis on something else, and he'll say, but I think that's the main point, or that's a side point, or whatever, or maybe you're not reading it right, and he'll correct you. And this is the ultimate um, 
situation, at least in, in the Jewish world, when people sit and learn. And it creates, like you don't have, you have, um, if you have a knife, okay, and you want to sharpen the knife, how do you sharpen? You have to use another tool, another piece of iron. And that's the way it's going to become sharpened. So uh, when two people are, and it sounds crazy, but when they're at war with each other, they're really not at war, but we're trying to get to the truth. So you're coming from one angle, the other person's come from another angle. He wants to try to understand your angle, you want to understand his angle, so you'll have to sharpen your blade, so to speak, which is really meaning sharpening the mind, and uh, hopefully you come out not just as friends but as lovers because he or she, um, your, your partner, helped you to uh, come to a greater truth, a greater understanding. So with that in mind, um, we, we read uh, in chapter 8, I believe, it was chapter 8 in Laws of Kings in the Rambam. And I want to stress a little bit, um, you know, before I actually reread re re -re this, I want to mention that we, we listed yes, uh, last week 30 mitzvahs that the Bnei Noach, yeah, remember, that's you. Cool, 92B, uh, A and B, uh, one of the mitzvahs, we both took a, a step back and said, hmm, that's strange. Why would Nevela be on this list, right? I think we both, because we know or we're aware of the fact that Nevela is something that a Ben Noach is certainly permitted um, in terms of even the Jewish community with the Ger Toshav should give him for free or provide uh, for a Ben Noach for sale. And um, why would it be in the list? So interestingly enough, let me see, I have the Rashi here. First of all, there's two lists that I was quoting from, and one of them was a, it was a better translation, I think, and um, it was n the one that says Nevela was in the Art Scroll Gemara. The, uh, the other list that I have, I printed off, it was from Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein, the City University of New York. So it says not to eat an animal that died naturally. And that's Rashi. So what did Rashi mean? What does it mean? I'll just, uh, if I can find it, the exact words here. It says like this. He actually quotes about the, um, we were talking about in those three things that they keep. Okay, I know if anybody doesn't know what we're talking about, you should go back and, and see the last video, but I'll try to fill those in, those people in that uh, are not so aware, that um, even though there were 30 mitzvahs that they accepted upon themselves, it seems like they weren't really keeping them, but they were keeping three, and one of them was not eating human flesh. So Rashi on that, after he explains it's human flesh, they at least didn't do it in public. They didn't sell it in the in the butcher shops, right? They, some people, they realized it was wrong, but they, they weren't doing it in public. So Rashi says, Vani Shamati, he adds, I heard, meaning an, another explanation, Basar Hamet, Basar Behema, Shemeta Me'atma. We're talking about dead meat, where the meat, the meat of the, of the animal died on its own. Now, I think there is a difference, okay, between what we call roadkill. <laughs> um, maybe that's not the exact, but let's say, say, oh, carrion. Carrion. you come across a carrion, carrion, is that the word you're saying? Like you yeah, come across that animal, you don't know if it died of disease or old age. How long? As opposed to, as opposed to when a Jew, let's say, slaughters an animal and he finds a nick in the knife, right? So a Jew cannot eat that animal. And that we call Nevela. It was killed, I'll use the word improperly, for a Jew. And that has the status of Nevela. And that is probably not the Nevela that we're referring to as a, as a Ben Noach should stay away from. It sounds from Rashi that the, the, ben, the Ben Noach should stay away from the animal that he finds on the side of the road or um, died of old age, right? Something that died on its own. And you don't know, maybe, God forbid, there's a disease, it was diseased. And it just makes more sense, which really kind of leads me into another idea. And I want to stress this more and more and more, and we're going to find out why I'm saying this, that the, we said that the seven laws are not seven laws. They're seven categories. It's very important. 
seven categories because someone asked me it was a little confusing i thought there was seven laws now you're saying there's 30. so there's two different views right either it's seven categories and there are many subcategories so there's a difference of opinion, different opinions some say there's 30 some say there's 60 some have even a higher number okay so that would be called subcategories if you read this the more that we read it sounds like they accepted upon them as additional mitzvahs, right? So maybe over and above. Remember, this is called beyond the seven. I want to stick to the mm -hmm. idea that we have seven overall overreaching um, general categories, and there are many subcategories. I'm going to just stick with that for, for, the, for the time being. So understand that not eating an animal that died naturally would fit into that category in the veil. But I want to define the word chassid. Because in the Rambam, chapter 8, in uh, law number 11, I want to focus a little bit on the, the, the words, right? Because all non-Jews, okay, maybe this is going to confuse people, but I want to try to not confuse anybody. I want to try to make things crystal clear. Awesome. Every person, there's 8 billion plus people on the planet. We are all considered B'nai Noach, right? All 8 billion people. However, the Jew, people from Isaac and Jacob, right, from Jacob, they are now in a category all on their own called Israel. So now they are, they are not B'nai Noach. So all 8 billion other people are B'nai Noach. But the Rambam, I believe, expresses there are two types. And perhaps there's even a third or a fourth. But he called them. Huh? Is this based on the covenant? Like, like we, we understand that the, the, the Jews are, are, are unique because of the covenant at Sinai. And the 8 billion, the rest of us, you know, we're all B'nai Noach, everybody, but this, the covenant themselves. But now you're saying there's two or three types? The covenant that God made with the Jewish people that removed us from that general category of the 8 billion people. Uh, if you want, I can just explain because we're going oh, to deal with the verse. We're going to deal with the verse. And wait one second. I wrote it down. I will find it. I will find it. Um, I have papers all over the place. Here it is. So when you go to Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, this is right before the acceptance of the Torah. Right? The Ten Commandments, so to speak, are in uh, chapter 20. So in chapter 19 where God proposes for us to enter a covenant, a unique covenant with him. He says, well, let's go to, we'll go to verse 5. Mm -hmm. And now, if you hearken well to me and observe my covenant, you shall be to me the most beloved treasure of all peoples, for mine is the entire world. You shall be to me a kingdom of ministers and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel, on and on and on. So in Hebrew, I just it's just so beautiful. So in Hebrew, in verse 5, the Yalta, now, Im Shemoa Tishma'u, if you really listen diligently, Bekoli, to my voice, Ushmartem et Priti, and you guard my covenant, this covenant we're entering, Item Li Segula, you're going to be treasured, most treasured, Mikol Ho'amim, from all the nations, Kili Kolarts, the whole world belongs to me. But this is where it says, Vatem to you li mamleches kohanim. You will be to me a kingdom of priests. Vagoy kadosh. A holy nation. And, and then it says, Elo devarim. These are the words that you're going to speak to the children of Israel. So we were considered removed from the seven and added another 606. Ruth, who is well known. I told you I wasn't going to speak too much about Gamachias. But uh, Ruth, who is considered... The um, par one of the paradigm examples of a convert, her name Ruth Raish Vav Tuf, is my right, Tuf is four hundred, Raish is two hundred, and above is six. So that's six hundred and six. She was she she accepted upon herself six hundred and six more mitzvot. She became a full fledged ger tzedek, okay, convert to Judaism. So now I want to just focus on chapter 8 um, in the, the laws of kings and their wars, where the, the Rambam discusses 
I believe, these two different types of B'nai Noach. And I'll, I'll say it outside first. One is, and I, the reason this really hit me, because this week I listened to a few of the different rabbis on, your, on, on the station here, and they were discussing, can a Ben Noach be a atheist? And I thought, that's interesting. I think the Rambam talks about this. So maybe atheist is not the word. Maybe agnostic is the word that I'm looking for. But I'll read it in English first. Anyone who accepts upon himself the fulfillment of the seven mitzvahs and is precise in their observance is considered one of the pious. The word pious in Hebrew is chassid. And we're going to discuss that word among the Gentiles and will merit a share in the world to come. But he makes a stipulation, okay? In other words, to be considered pious, this applies only when he accepts them and fulfills them because of the whole, because the Holy One, blessed be he, commanded them in the Torah and informed us through Moses, our teacher, that even previously Noah's descendants were commanded to fulfill them. So Ben Noah already had to keep them. So there's, I'm going to call this a higher level. The higher level of a Ben Noah who's called a Chassid and will be granted eternal life, the world to come. The next statement is a little bit controversial. He says, however, if he fulfills them out of intellectual conviction, to me, that would be an atheist. <laughs> Maybe it's an agnostic, but he feels that this is the correct way. Yeah. Why? Because, because maybe moral, maybe it just makes sense for society. He's not a resident alien, meaning he cannot be considered a Gertosha, nor can he be considered pious amongst the nations. So we already said the pious is the one who goes to heaven and the one who accepted the Torah not because of personal uh, intellectual conviction, but something much broader. Now, these next words are the reason I say it's controversial, because there are different texts. So the text I'm reading from says, nor are they considered amongst their wise men of the nations. Right. But I want to tell you something. There's an ancient text, a written text, like handwritten by the Rambam himself. I just have to find it. Really? And it's more popular. It's actually more accepted nowadays. Uh, I will find it. I know I'm going to find it. Here it is. You're anything like me, Rabbi. I've got there's stuff in there's a, the Frankel edition of the Rambam puts in a lot of things that were only in the um, Yad, in the, in the handwritten manuscripts. And it's known that it was in Yemenite. So the Yemenite community... They, they had, Rambam was their rabbi, and they had communication, and they had these handwritten manuscripts. So in the Rambam over there, it says, Ella, not below, not, not from amongst the wise, but rather from amongst the wise. So in other words, when we read it again and say, however, if he fulfills them out of intellectual conviction, he's not a resident alien, nor is he a pious amongst the nation, but... He is considered amongst the wise of the nations. So we do have a, a statement in Chazal that says, if you were told the Torah is amongst the nations, don't believe them. But if you were told there's wisdom amongst the nations, believe them. So knowing that statement, I believe clearly, and many people bring down, this is the, the text I just quoted you, Ella. Rather, they're called amongst the, they're considered amongst the wise of the nations. So I would think, I'm not sure if atheist is the term used, but at least agnostic. Someone who says, you know what? I don't believe in idols, so I'm not going to worship them, right? I'm not going to curse God because maybe he exists, <laughs> right? But I'll keep the seven because it's good for society. So I think, and clearly, that this is considered a Ben Noach, but he's not going to get the world to come. The question is why? Why should he be excluded? He right? doesn't want it. He's not interested, perhaps. He never dealt, 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 dealt deeply enough. But we, everything in this world is me, measure for measure. Mida can neged mida. Measure for measure. So he doesn't believe in the world to come, right? He's not interested, perhaps, as you said. I think it's deeper than that. 
there's a there's a Mishnah in um, in Sanhedrin in Parachelik um, in the eleventh chapter that talks about Bilam. It talks about the different people that don't get a place in the world to come. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. I can get it, but I'll try. Your with... summary will do. Okay. That um, I should have it in front of me, but okay. So basically, it says that all Jews have a, all of Israel have a portion in the world to come, and then it tells you who doesn't. So if you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, you're not going to get it. And if you don't believe the Torah is from heaven, you're not going to have the world to come. So knowing these things, it's about a Jew. So I would say really the same thing applies to a Gentile. But what makes me say that? Because in the list of there's these categories of ideas, philosophical ideas, and then there are lists. There are a certain amount of kings, a certain amount of people who are excluded. And we learn these are principles. Again, it's not just these three um, kings or these four people, but the, what they stood for. And Bilaam is listed amongst them. And everyone says, why would he even be listed there? If you said all oh, Israel has a place in the world to come, except for these people who don't believe these ideas or these people in particular, he's not even Jewish. Why is he in the list? Yeah, and so we learn because he is a Gentile mm -hmm. and Gentiles have a place in the world to come. He has to be listed there. So you know that people like him would not uh, merit the world to come. I actually have some of the Gemara here. Let me just see where, because I thought it was interesting to talk about. As a proof text, it's in Sanhedrin, um, page 105. Um, it mentions there are four prominent commoners who are not going to have a, world, a share in the world to come. That's Bilam, Doeg, Achitofel, and Gehazi. Okay. And so the Gomorrah goes like this. There's a maklokis. A maklokis means a discussion of seeming disagreement between Rabbi Yoshua and Rabbi Eliezer. So Rabbi Eliezer is going to make the claim that Gentiles do not have a place in the world to come. But before I begin to tell you, the Gomorrah prefaces it and says, the halakha is not like him. It goes like Rabbi Yeshua, just to keep that in mind. But you have to hear the other side. So it says in Psalms 918, the wicked shall tur be turned back to the netherworld, all that nations that forget God. So the way he understood it was that it is talking about the, the Jewish people, who are, whoever are sinners, the, the wicked, they're going to be turned back from the netherworld. But then it says, all the nations that forget God. So he considers that means all the sinners of the Gentiles. Again, but he's, he's considering it as if the word, I'll say in Hebrew because it says, the actual word is like this. This is how it is. Yeshuvu Rashayim the Shaula, right? Will return all the all of the um, the wicked will return to the grave. Kol Goyim Shechechei Elokim, all the nations that forget God, as if there's an equation that all the nations are going, all the nations who obviously don't believe in our God are going to, uh, to I'll use the word hell, or this, uh, this place called the grave. But Rabbi Yeshua says it doesn't say kick coal. It just says coal. So it's only referring to the, the non-Jews who don't believe in God. Okay? They for, it means they forgot, only the Gentiles that forgot about God. This is very important. I'll just read the words that he says. <clears throat> this is huge. Rabbi, Rabbi, the statement of Rabbi Yezer. Fine. Okay. Rabbi Yeshua said to him, but does it say in the verse that the sinners of the Jewish people will be like all the Gentiles? It doesn't say ke kol goyim. It just says kol goyim. It says all the Gentiles that forget God. So rather, now we understand, it means the wicked shall be turned back to the netherworld. And who are they? They are all the Gentiles that forget God, meaning the Gentiles who fear God do have a share in the world to come. 
Okay, so now we got that clear. <laughs> Putting all the stuff, all the information I put to the side so we don't, uh, uh, my, my desk is still full of tons of stuff, but okay. Um, now, what does it mean to be a chassid? In other words, how do we define? So most translation would be saintly, pious. Remember, this title, the title of the series is called Beyond the Seven. Again, what does that mean? It means taking the seven seriously, as the Rambam explained, who's careful in them, careful in them knowing that what? That they came, they were revealed to Moses. Yes, it was true that before Moses, it was known to the world, but it was stressed or repeated at the revelation at Mount Sinai. Okay, so... What is a chassid? Ah, from all of my knowledge in Judaism, is that a chassid is someone who goes beyond the letter of the law. Beyond. You have the letter of the law, and in fact, I'll even tell you a, a secret. It says that the temple, the Gemara tells us that the temple was destroyed, that Jerusalem was destroyed because the Jews kept the Torah. Everyone says, what? That can't be. Aren't we supposed to keep the Torah? So the Gemara uh, goes on to describe, yeah, of course they're supposed to keep the Torah, but they're actually supposed to go beyond the letter of the law. And they didn't do that. This is because they kept. Them. They were destroyed because they bare kept minimum. them. <laughs> they kept the law. You can call it bare minimum, whatever it is. You got the letter of the law, and I'm only going to go to that point, and that's it. So if I think of the word, that's the word that the Rambam uses, and that's the word that the Gemara uses. We're talking, I'll say in Hebrew, kolim akabel sheva mitzvahs, v'nizhar lo sotam, all who accept the seven mitzvahs, and his nizhar, I'll, 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 I'll translate as extremely careful to do that. He's considered amongst the chasidei umos olam, the pious. And pious to me means simply, I mean, <laughs> at least in Judaism, it means to go beyond. Yesh lo chelek le'olam abba. He gets a portion in the world to come. And he continued, he says, v'hu, shekabel osam. He accepted them. And he does them because God commanded them in the Torah. And it was revealed or made known to us through Moshe. Even though the children of Noah were commanded before. But if he's only doing them because of intellectual conviction, a intellectual, this makes sense. Now, I have to tell you, because this also leads into the other idea, that within the seven overall reaching principles, anything that makes sense in the Torah, a non-Jew has to do. Uh, the question is, to what extent? To the finest of details? I don't know. But in terms of being um, amongst the Hasidic Umus Olam, I would assume that they would want to do everything that makes sense. And things that don't make sense, that's what the Jew is doing. Okay, now I'm going to lead into that because there's a very important verse we're going to read. Hopefully we'll get to it. I'm putting my mind on it now. We're going to do it. Okay. Um, so I hope this was a little bit clear to some of those who are listening because I heard, can a Ben Noah be an atheist? I think yes, but it's very difficult <clears throat> to come to that conclusion. I understand. Because if you have, is believing in God, it sounded like it was one of those, for sure, one of those 30. Is it one of the subcategories? Yeah. Those subcategories are for the pious. Can you just be, you know, a, a, an atheist or agnostic Ben Noach? Perhaps, but you're only going to get a reward. You're only going to be rewarded in this world. This world, I want to know, now mention, I have a beautiful um, thing I did many, many years ago. I put together a list of all the different sevens in Judaism, okay? So I'll just, uh, it's a three-page list. <laughs> I only want to highlight a few of them because seven represents perfection in this world, okay? So hear me out. And eight, which somehow related to the Jew, right? We have Shemini Atzeres, the eighth day, we call it the eighth day of Sukkot, 
meaning the day beyond. That's unique for the Jewish people. The Brit Milah is done on the eighth day. There's so many things with eight. But in the meantime, I just want to stick with sevens, right? We have seven days of creation. There's no, there's no accident here that God created the whole world in seven days, okay? Um, when Noah brought animals, there were seven pairs of clean animals that he had to bring up onto the ark. Seven colors of the rainbow. Seven directions in which there is. There's up, down, forward, backward, left, right, and center, middle. Um, during the seventh year, which we have Shemitah every seven years, and then we have Jubilee, which is every seven times seven. Uh, by the way, Jethro, who was a very famous convert, um, he had seven names, and he also had seven daughters. Uh, we have seven seas, seven continents. Um, by the way, when the Torah was revealed, it was the seventh generation after Moses. You had Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Kahat, Amram, and Moshe. Uh, there are seven heavens. Okay, I, I didn't really want to go through the entire list, but I do want to, oh, do I have a few more? Yeah, there's seven notes on the musical scale. Um, let's just go to the two verses I want to focus on, and that's in Psalms chapter 12, verse 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Seven times, seven times seven, seven times. It's also Proverbs 9.1. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Seven pillars. It's so important for the, for the world to be involved in the seven Noahide laws. And the stress, we did see there's a whole discussion. Can a, Jew learn, can a non-Jew learn Torah? So I'm going to delve into that a little bit right now. I want to start with something that's brought down in the Nefesh HaChaim. And these are the notes, Rav Chaim Velazhin. And, and he says like this, <clears throat> the relationship of Jew to non-Jew is like that of a priest to a member of the congregation he serves. As per the scriptural description of the Jewish people in the verse I read in the beginning in Exodus 19.6, we are called a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Both positions of priest and congregant have significance in corresponding obligations. They have different obligations. A priest is not a priest if he has no congregation, and a congregation requires a priest to provide assistance. The Jew is obligated to observe 613 mitzvot, and the non-Jew similarly has the obligation to observe the seven Noahide laws. Both Jew and non-Jew have the ability and a free choice to generate what we call tikkun or rectification or chilul, damage, through their actions. However, the Jew's obligation and responsibility is to rectify both himself and the worlds around him, whereas the non-Jew's obligation is to rectify himself. <clears throat> Therefore, the impact of a Jew's actions reaches further. Should any non-Jew wish to take on a greater level of obligation, he also has the free choice to convert to Judaism as long as it is, is done with full conviction. However, a non-Jew is able to reach meaningful spiritual heights of perfection in serving God without converting to Judaism. Mm, beautiful. So these are all important texts, I hope, that are uh, meaningful to the out here. Now, going back to this idea of a chassid. So there is in Perkei Avot. You guys all familiar with Perkei Avot? So if you go to, um, it's really in the second chapter, and it's the fifth Mishnah. But I thought it would be good to actually read the, the fourth Mishnah as well. So this is about Hillel. He used to say, do his will, do God's will, as though it were your will, so that he, God, will do your will as though it were his. Set aside your will in the face of his will so that he may set aside the will of others for the sake of your will. Okay, this is very deep, but basically to be a servant of God. My wife and I were discussing what does it mean in this present day? Everyone is like, they don't know what's going on. They don't know. 
what to believe. That everything is contradictory. Every five minutes, every time you change a channel, there's different, um, there's different professors, there's different doctors, there's different. They're giving the opposite advice. You want to know what is my job here? What am I supposed to do? So I told my wife, and she totally agreed. She thought it was very deep, actually. What does it mean to be an Eved Hashem, to be a, a servant of God? And I think that's what this mission really is about, to know that whatever God requires me, I'm willing to do. So I don't have to do everything right now. I'll wait for the proper instructions. I, I, I want to know exactly. I want to know every detail about what's going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen. When the, you know, I guess in, your, in the army, you get used to this. If you have a commander, right? Because we're not slaves. So we don't have, um, you know, a human uh, boss. Maybe we do in certain, uh, certain uh, cases in certain work uh, environments. But when your boss says something, you just do it. You know, you can ask how high and how far, but, you, you know, because you want to do the job right. So if you're willing to turn your will over to the care of God, so then uh, everything's going to be just fine. Anyway, he continues, and I also heard this idea because what is it about a community? Everybody needs a community. There's no, it's not called a new religion to have a, a community. We will talk about it. this is not a new religion. This religion goes back to Adam, to Noah, to Abraham. This is this thing called I call it Noahidism. I, I don't know if there's a term. It's called Judaism for non-Jews. Okay, it's not. It's, you're not allowed to create your own religion. We saw that also in the Rambam. This is one of the main reasons that um, you know. I just referred to it was in chapter ten. I believe it was Halacha ten. The Rambam stresses. Klolo Shodavar, the main point of that Halacha. That was talking about involving yourself in Torah or keeping Shabbos was ein manichi mosun lechadesh das. You, we don't allow them. It's not permissible to create a new religion because if they don't learn Torah from the Jews, they will. I mentioned this in the land. You will find yourself creating a new religion. You're going to keep Shabbos on Friday or on Sunday, and that's what's called a new religion. So you're talking about Judaism for non-Jews. That would be the best way to describe it. <clears throat> Anyway, he says, do not separate yourself from the community. Everyone needs a community. Do not trust in yourself into the day of your death. Do not, ju do not judge your fellow man until you reach his place. Right? They say, like, uh, don't judge a man until you step in his shoes. Do not say something that cannot be understood, trusting that in the end it will be understood. Say not, when I have leisure, I will study. Because maybe you won't have that time. Now's the time to study. And that brings us to the very next. This is really the highlight of what I want to talk about. Kilo used to say, I'll say in Hebrew first, Ein bor yirechet. A bor is worse than an, an ignoramus, okay? It's like a totally, totally uneducated person. He cannot fear sin. V'lo am ha'aretz chasid. These are the words I really wanted to focus. An am ha'aretz is someone who is ignorant. He's not well learned. He cannot be a chassid. So what are we talking about here? Beyond the seven, meaning I want to call myself, I was a non-Jew, I would want to be grouped with the people who are considered chassid umusa olam, the pious or the saintly of the nations. And it doesn't mean just keeping the seven according to the letter of the law. I think that's clear by now. Even the Jews are not supposed to keep the Torah according to the letter of the law. That was clear in the Gemara expressed. They told us why Yerushalayim was destroyed, because the Jews only kept the Torah. And that we, we, we found unfathomable. But when we understood the Gemara, and he explains it so clearly, that the Jew is supposed to go beyond. And if we're the priest and we're supposed to teach you how to act, then you should follow our lead. Take the seven seriously. That's first of all. Find out what they mean. They're not just seven laws. They're seven categories. Go deep. Right? We talked about chesed. We talked about doing kind acts. Right, And what really got me started was, I can't believe, if some, I was a Ben Noach, and a Ben Noach comes to me and says, I need a loan because I got no food on my table or I need to start a business because I'm out of work and I got, I've created a new, new way in this new world to make some money because I can't work in the old, in the old uh, fashion I was working in. Well, why wouldn't I give him an interest-free loan? It does not if that's what the Jews do, so I would do the same thing, right? 
Am I obligated? No, especially if the person already has money and just needs another million of liquidity to uh, make a few, a few more bucks. You know, I might as well go into business with him. But anyway, so an ignorant person cannot be pious. I'll read the rest of the Mishnah. Nor can a tamid, tamid, I guess it's a very like, uh, um, let's see in the Hebrew, a baishan, someone who's embarrassed, who's uh, afraid. He, he can't learn. And why can't he learn? Because he's afraid to raise his hand and say, I don't understand. Right? If he's very uh, embarrassed and the guy, the, the teacher could be going to the next lesson already, thinking that everyone understood it, and he doesn't stand up on his two feet and says, I need a tutor or I need extra time with you. Or it's just, I missed one word, and that one word, I just don't get the whole lesson because of that one word. Nor can an impatient person teach. Okay. I have to take that for my, my, myself. Nor will someone who engages too much in business become wise, perhaps. Why? Maybe because he's too busy making money. Uh, in a place where there is no man, strive to be a man. I think you really think about the word chassi, because that's what, in other words, to say a Ben Noach has to fit in one category, I think is missing the point. Baruch Hashem, that there will be non-Jews who will keep the seven out of a intellectual conviction. I think that's a positive move for most of this 8 billion people on the planet, okay? For people who think that stealing is, is they don't even think twice, right? It's, come on, at least the person is thinking about it, right? To murder. He would never murder anybody because he just thinks it's wrong. This is, this is someone to be, I think, applauded, okay? But he should know, this is, you, you have a status of a Venach. Maybe you're an atheist. Maybe you're agnostic. I don't know, okay? But uh, so you don't believe in God. So, okay, but you're a Ben Noach and you're, you're a mensch. And, but between me and you and the lamppost, we know that he does not have a place in the world to come, but he will get reward in this world. He will be rewarded in this world. Why wouldn't he? Hashem said do this, and he's doing it. Okay, so that's, uh, put that aside. Boy, that puts a lot of clarity out there, Rabbi. <laughs> so I want to talk about the idea of, of learning, right? Why should, why should one learn? I don't know where to start. Um, I have two pieces I want to talk about. One are prophecies, and one is the Mishnah Torah, the Rambam's laws in Shemitah and Jubilee in chapter 13. Let's start there. So it's really 13, but I want to go back to 12 and maybe even go back. I told you one of my biggest problems is I, I read something and I have to go back to see in context. I want to have a running start. And usually I never get running because I always go back, back, back. But uh, we were talking, the previous halakhot, we're talking about the Levites. Remember, the Jews also made up of a priestly class. And the Kohen and the Levites do not get a farmland. They don't get land in which to work. Okay, they go to the cities, and our maaser, our tithes, uh, will support them. Okay, and it's because they are the teachers. So in number twelve, this is chapter thirteen, uh, halacha twelve in the Mishnah Torah on the laws of shemitah and jubilee. Why did the Levites not receive a portion in the inheritance of Eretz Israel and in the spoils of war like their brethren? The answer is because they were set aside to serve God and minister unto him and to instruct people at large in his just paths and righteous judgments. You can find this in Deuteronomy chapter 33, uh, verse 10. It says, they will teach your judgments to Jacob and your Torah to Israel. Therefore, they were set apart from the ways of the world, meaning not to engage in farm, land, farm work or business. They don't engage in war. They don't wage war like the remainder of the Jewish people. Nor do they receive an inheritance, nor do they acquire for themselves through their physical power. Instead, they are called God's legion. It says in uh, verse 11, under Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 11, God has blessed his legion. L-E-G-I-O-N. And he provides for them. If you look in very important numbers, 18, verse 20, God says, I am your portion and your inheritance. Uh, 
Um, the comment on this, the Rambam cites in the first portion of the verse in Halacha 10 as proof the Levites are not entitled to a portion of the spoil nor in, 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 in ancestral heritage in Eretz Israel. In this halacha, he explains the rationale for the exclusion. The Levites are set aside from, from material, in, material involvement so they can devote themselves to the spiritual. However, God, however, promises this is an exchange, this, that this exchange will not cause any of them a loss, that God will provide their material needs. And it's provided through the maaser, through the tithes. Now, this is the real important halacha, because we did read that a, a non-Jew is not supposed to be learning Torah. Now, we already explained that means that they should be learning the Torah that they're obligated, which is probably like 98% of the Torah. I mean, it's all the written Torah, right? And it's probably, I'm going to use 95 to 98% of the oral Torah as well. Wow. This is, this, this is mind-boggling. This is the Rambam, not only the tribe of Levi. So we just got done saying that the Levi is dedicated to Torah. Not only the tribe of Levi, but any one of the inhabitants of the world. And everyone understands this to mean, I could say everybody, probably 98% understand it to mean this, I have a comment here, 27, this wording implies Gentiles. A, in other words, I'm not a Levi. Maybe I am, but let's say I'm not. And I want to dedicate my, myself to Torah. I can give up my job and dedicate myself. Now, what does it mean, give up my job? How am I going to live? Okay, so that's a whole discussion on its own, okay? And we're going to get into it a little bit now. Someone wants to be like Levi. He's not, he doesn't have the halakhic status of Levi, but whose spirit generously motivates him and he understands with his wisdom to set himself aside and stand before God to serve him and minister to him and to know God. We're talking about Gentiles as well. Proceeding justly as God made him, removing from his neck the yoke of the many reckonings which people seek. And he is considered holy of holies, sanctif sanctified, Beautiful. God will be his portion and heritage forever and will provide what is sufficient for him in this world, like he provides for the priests and the Levites. And even King David declared in Psalm 16, 5, God is the lot of my portion. You are my cup. You support my lot. Now, what does this mean? I mean, to say... Non-Jew should not learn Torah is 100% wrong, right? We already established that. In the, the whole written Torah, the whole Tanakh, everyone agrees they can read. This is a lot to learn, okay? It's a Tanakh. It's kind of small. Okay. And the only way you can learn any of it anyway is by learning it from the Jews because they were there. They know what, the, what it means, okay? I have a few examples. Did I bring it down here? I know I did. I have to find it. Um, oh, we talked about this a little bit before. How do you know? How do you know about the oral Torah anyway? We can't hear it from anywhere except from the Jewish people. Listen, I'll just give you like a few ideas, right? It says in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 21, God says to slaughter as I commanded you. And nowhere does it explain the five different laws of slaughtering, right? The knife has to be completely sharp, right? Can't have a nick, right? And when you slaughter, it has to be in a certain place and it can't be with any pressure and you can't do any stabbing and you have to go back and forth. Um, you can't stop in the middle. There's a, there's a, what does it mean? Slaughter as I command you, but there's nowhere written these details. What about to fill in in Exodus chapter 13, verses nine through 16, again in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter eight, six, sorry, six. Verse 8 in chapter 11, verse 18, these are called tefillin. It's a sign. God tells you to put a sign on your body and doesn't explain what it is, right? You can have a whole bunch of people creating their own religion. They just, they don't know what they're talking about, right? 
Here, I have a great one. Oh, so I told you I was going to do gamachia, but okay. So an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So ayin tachas ayin, shame tachas shame. Right? Everyone knows that verse, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. From the very beginning, we were at Mount Sinai. We knew this involved five different types of financial, um, rem I forget the word, but uh, remuneration of some sorts, right? For doctor's bills, unemployment, pain, libel, li you know, libel, suffering of different sorts. The word kesef, kaf, samich, pay. Believe it or not, that's kesef. The word I, it says I and takasayin, an I for an I. But the word for also can be translated as an underneath. I'm sure you heard the word tukas. So the word tachat, tachat, an I, ayin, tachat, ayin. So it, it means whatever, whatever is underneath the ayin. So you have ayin yud nun. So whatever you have is the um, the ayin, the letter that comes after an ayin is a pay. Uh, yud, the letter that comes after yud is a kaf. And uh, the letter that comes after nun is a samach. So the letters that are underneath the word ayin, ayin, is money. The words are saying it to you. It's like screaming at you. Okay? There's an oral Torah right in front of you. Right? I mean, well, not in front of you, but it needs to be told to you. So it was never in Judaism that if somebody accidentally or even purposely stuck out someone's eye or broke their tooth, had to have their eye or tooth removed. Yes, there's a discussion in the Gemara that whose tooth are you replacing? In other words, if God forbid, I was the one who, okay, let's not use me as an example. Somebody A, took out B's eye. So the question is, we ask, how much would it cost you to be willing to not give, have, have your eye not removed? Right or mm -hmm. so in other words, if my eye is valuable to me, so what am I willing to pay not to have I, my eye removed? My eye would never have been removed, but there's money in place of the eye, as we just explained. The question is: Is it going to according to my eye or his eye? What if he, the guy that w was uh, damaged, was a pianist, a mamisha, uh, I don't know, top-notch pianist, mm -hmm. and God forbid. Whatever accident happened, that that or maybe a Nerves surgeon in his hand or something. His hand. Is it going to go according to my hand, who I sit and watch vegetables grow all day and scare away the birds, or am I going to pay a much higher amount for the penis or the surgeon's hand? So that's the discussion. Okay, so that's another idea. Um, no, it makes great sense. All through the Torah, all through the Torah, it says, Yedaber Hashem El Moshe Lema. God spoke to Moses saying, why do you need to say, why does the Torah need to say, God spoke to Moses saying? First of all, in Hebrew, the Yedaber, we we're told is a harsh language, and it's, um, what's the word? It's like written in stone, right? And that, that the Torah actually is. The Torah itself is written, and there's no... You can't even mess up one letter, right? You can't be missing a letter, and a letter can't be smudged. Okay. The Yedaber, so that's God spoke to Moses. Lamor means to say over. God spoke to Moses to say over in what language? In your own language you can convey to them. That's the way a teacher always has to teach his student in a language that the student can hear. So Moses heard from God one way. And he was told to, told to tell over. But the Hebrew, and more, is different than the word v'yedaber. V'yedaber is a harsh language that is in stone and concrete and unmovable and unchangeable. Lamor is how to say it over. It's a soft language. Lamor is the difference between tell and say over, right? It's like different, totally different. God was told to say over. So this is a, one of the ideas. That, that this is showing you that there's a, a um, an oral Torah. Yeah, transmission. Transmission, thank you. Um, okay, I have a few more, but um, I don't know why I didn't write the verses down, but uh, the concept. Like whenever there is a doubt in the Torah, so you're supposed to go up to Yerushalayim, I'll find it. 
to Deuteronomy 13, or 18, I think, let's see. Yeah, probably 13. Uh, 17. Okay, chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, uh, verses 8 and onward. Right, if there's a matter of judgment that's hidden from you between blood and blood, between verdict and verdict, between plague and plague, matters of dispute in your cities, you shall rise up and ascend to the place that Hashem your God shall choose. So you're not going anywhere. You're going specifically. Now, if you had a discussion in a lower court that they found a, uh, a doubt, they, they were not able to resolve it, so then you could take it to the next court, right? That's how it works in most places. So we're not talking about a major matter. Um, we're, not, we're not talking about a, a minor matter that could be resolved easily. We're talking about a matter of dispute in your cities, and it was not resolved. Hmm? More, more than an appeal, something like a matter for a not, not an appeal, court. Right. You're not going to go against the base din. The base din, the court itself, did not have a decision. Okay, it's a big difference. You should come to the Kohanim, the Levites, who we already discussed their job, and to the judge who will be in those days. So it's not only the Kohanim and the Levites, but anybody who's capable of being a judge would be a Talmud Chacham, a sage. You shall do according to the word. Listen, the word. you should do what the word does it to the script, to what it says in the Bible. <laughs> it doesn't say that. It says you shall do according to the word that they tell you, which already you're talking about allowing a group of people to use their brains they're coming to the bet, we we'll call it the truth of truths, right? They're trying their best to give you what they understood God to be saying. You had a doubt, right? It's something that's a doubt. Anything that's clear is not in this discussion. So then you have to do what they tell you to do. Listen to the words. You should, this is verse 10. You shall do according to the word that they tell you from the place that Hashem will choose, and you shall be careful to do according to everything that they will teach you then it sounds ridiculous to repeat it. According, verse 11, according to the teachings that they will teach you and according to the judgment that they will tell you, you shall do and you shall not deviate from the word, again, word, that they tell you right or left. Mm, to the right hand or to the left. Rabbi, uh, you know, can I just say, is this not why the prophets prophesied the way they did, and the world might turn to Jerusalem. Based on this premise that you're talking about, that system in the time of Mashiach uh, that fulfills this, go to Jerusalem and um, bring those matters, and they, they'll be dealt with in this. I think there's just something massively beautiful here that the world needs to hear. Listen, anybody that believes in Scripture has an easier time understanding and I'm gonna that's where I mentioned I'm gonna bring a few of these ideas down. So let's start with Deuteronomy chapter four verses six through eight. I see this as more prophetic and we'll start and and you shall keep them. This is the Jewish people. God through Moses is talking to us. You shall keep them and do them. We're talking about the Torah. Why? For that is your wisdom and your understanding in the eyes of the people. But I want to clarify something. It says, who will hear all these statutes. What is it about the word statute? Here it's called chukim. Kol ha-chukim. I'm going to go back. This is what God tells us. You're going to keep them. You're going to do them because it's going to be good for you. But guess what? It's called your wisdom and your understanding. But it says in the eyes of the people who will hear all these statutes, they're going to actually hear them. This is one of the proofs that the Gentile, as a sincere Gentile, has no problem learning, and I'm going to use again 99, 98% of the Torah. It says all of these statutes. <laughs> well, first of all, chukim are those things that are not understandable, not easily comprehended. So in other words, to not murder, to not steal, and we can go on to do chesed, to all these things that we already said that a ben noach, a ben noach, a righteous person, Gentile, should do. What about all these other things that are called chukim, like shatnet, not putting um, wool and linen in the same garment, 
not, let's say, eating matzah on Passover, sitting in a sukkah, uh, you know, putting a, a four species together on sukkahs and, and waving them. They're hukim. So that is not really, I use the word shayich, they're not really related to the Gentile uh, way of life. They're the hukim. That's what the Jews are keeping. The Jews hopefully are keeping all the rest of the mishpatim, right, all the other laws. But in addition, what is unique to us is what we call the chukim. And it sounds from here, from this verse, that they will understand, they will hear all these. How, how does the Torah tell me that they're going to hear about them all and not learn about them? Hearing about them and learning about them are, to me, intertwined. Because Shema Yisrael, like understand. In other words, Shema is understanding. Ushmar, and I'll read the Hebrew. Ushmarta vasitem. You're going to guard them and you're going to do them. Kihu achmatchem ubinatchem. It's your wisdom and your understanding. Leinei haamim to the eyes of the Gentiles, the nations. Asher yishmaun. They actually hear. They hear. Kol achukim. They're hearing beyond the seven. They're hearing beyond the. The, the ones that make sense, the ones that are logical, which they're obligated to keep. They're hearing about them. Ha'ela, the Amru. And you know what they say as a result? This is what they say. Yeah. Verse 7. Only this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is at all times we call upon him. And what great nation is it that has just statutes? How do they know? How do they know these are just statutes and ordinances as this entire Torah, which I said before? God himself is saying they hopefully they'll, they'll open their eyes. They'll see. How can they see? How can they open their eyes if they don't learn something? They have to be learning something. You with me so far? Okay. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. Many peoples and powerful nations will come to entreat the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. You mentioned about coming to Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. So said the Lord of hosts. This is a prophecy of the future, but I think the future is now. In those days when ten men of all languages of the nation shall take hold of the skirt or the garment of the Jewish man, saying what let us go with you for we have heard again we have heard that god is with you how can they hear what does that mean to, to hear little, first of all more than just audible audible sound right first of all it's again the word shamanu elokim we heard the word shema means to understand not just to hear there's some kind of understanding now i just want to use again not no no gamachas here just simple math okay how many nations how many nations are there 70 nations so when it says that many people yeah, where's the word okay here it is esser anashim 10 men mikola shonot from all the different languages all the different nations so you have 10 men from the different nations. So there's 70 nations. That means 10 men. So that's 700, correct? In other words, what did you think when you read this? 10 men are going to each Jew. No. 10 men from each nation Language is going nation, yeah. to hang on to what? The corners. What do you mean the corners? How many corners does a Jewish garment have? Four. Four. This is where it gets to 2,800 from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know where it's so, all going, sure. I just think the audience would appreciate it. So I think every Jew, every Jew who's listening, you have to be prepared. And every non-Jew, if you feel that you want to be amongst those pious of the nations, we, we spoke about this in, uh, in the laws of Shemitah, right? I didn't make it up, right? It was right there in front of us. Anyone, even non-Jews, can dedicate themselves to learn it, to teaching. He said teaching. I, we already discussed this idea. You cannot be a teacher if you do not learn. There's no such thing. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 19. Jeremiah, I'm sorry, forgive me, Rabbi, I was typing. 
Jeremiah. So, 16, verse 19. O oh Lord, who are my power and my strength and my refuge in the day of trouble, to you nations will come from the ends of the earth. So we're talking about the non-Jews are going to come and say to the Jewish people, only lies have our fathers handed down to us. Emptiness in which there is nothing of any avail. How will someone come to this understanding? Try to use your imagination. There's all kinds of ways. There could be open miracles. There could be. Why do we have to wait till the last minute is what I'm asking. <laughs> now, now's the time. Now's the time to come to this understanding. There's not to shem. For anybody who is sincere. And I've spoken to rabbis. Anybody who is sincere about inquiring about conversion, that doesn't mean they have to convert. Just that they, they're checking out the possibilities. They may come to the conclusion, this is not for me because my spouse, because of my whatever it is. They have a million reasons why, but they're sincere individuals. They're allowed to learn Torah. Okay? If they are inquiring, everybody agrees. If Everybody. That if you actually... This non-Jew actually wants to convert or has the, the he's checking it out. You're allowed to teach him Torah. And Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. We all know this. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the seabed. So what are we talking about here? What are, we, are we talking about the knowledge of God? Or are we talking about like a, a, just a little pinprick of, of knowledge? That's going to. We're talking. This is this is the prophecy. It's going to happen. Something else I wanted to share. And I. Oh, this is important. Oh yeah. So we love these things in, you're sharing. In in a oh I do want to I want to bring this up not really okay I'll leave that aside in, in in the in a safer a new book that came out which is I'm not sure it's really out yet but I got permission to share a paragraph uh, from Brit Shalom so um, this is on the chapter well, it's not really the chap chapter but it's a sub chapter called cleaving to God. So this is, book is dedicated towards the knowledge of, of B'nai Noach, of non-Jews, who want to advance in their being of service to, to the world. To any person whose benevolent spirit, this is the quote that I read, that I gave you from uh, Hilka Shemitah in the Rambam. But he has some good footnotes on it. Any person whose benevolent spirit, that means moving spirit and understanding mind, brought him to a place of separation. He wants to separate himself from everyone else. To stand before the Lord, to serve and worship him, to gain knowledge of the Lord, and has walked in a straight path as God created him, and removed from his neck the yoke of human calculations, is consecrated as a most holy soul. And the Lord will be his portion and his inheritance forever and ever. Now, there's a different opinion among the sages as to what is the appropriate extent to which a Noahide should learn Torah. There are those who restricted study to parts of the Torah with universal application, which touch on the foundations of faith, morality, and law that are meant especially for Noahides. There are those, there are also the, I'm sorry, there are also those who distinguish between a non-Jew who did not take upon himself the seven Noahide laws, who would be limited as stated in his study, and a proper Noahide who was permitted to learn the entire Torah. He says, he quotes, this second opinion is the prevailing one. Now I want to actually quote, I want to actually go into the, um, into uh, the Rambam, because he actually uses a different language. And I'll, I'll, I'll share that in a second. I just want to finish here. Among the ways of cleaving to God is to become attached to Torah sages through learning from their upright conduct. Mm. 
So, okay, what I want to show you, if you go to that chapter 10 in the Rambam that talks about learning Torah, how it's um, frowned upon, he doesn't say a Ben Noach. He uses the word goy. Remember, I started the class saying there are different types of goy is the general term for all Noachites. And then there's the Rambam made two different uh, levels. There's a amongst the wise, and he kind of pushed that aside, right? There's a whole difference whether it's even worth mentioning, but I told you the manuscripts do mention it, and therefore he has a place in this world. He'll have reward in this world. But the way the Rambam says, it says, Goy Sha'isek Batara. He doesn't use the word Ben Noach. A Goy, and in some place it says Akum, which means an idol worship. So an idol worship who involves himself in Torah, he's the one who is strongly under no, under no circumstance should be studying Torah. However, later on, in, in that was uh, Halacha 9. In Halacha 10, he says, Ben Noach. Sharatzalos mitzvah. He wants to do any of the mitzvahs from all the other mitzvahs. Again, does that include learning Torah? Does that include Shabbos? Put that aside. In order to receive schar, we don't prevent him from doing so as long as he does them correctly. I stress over and over again, any Noachite, any non-Jew that wants to do additional mitzvahs, it says he has to do them kehalacha. He has to do them according to the halacha. So how is he supposed to know the halacha? He has to learn if he wants to do them. So he wants to do shotness or he wants to do whatever it is. He has to learn. It's it's right. It's as clear as day. So the first halacha says a goy or an akum, someone who is not in the category of accepting of the Noachad laws. The reason he's not going, we're not going to push him to learn, and we're not going to encourage him to learn is because he's just there to mock us. He's just there to cause trouble. If he's sincere, so then first of all, he'll he'll change, he'll start learning on his own, and he'll come as, as a Ben Noach who wants to do, and he's already in the next category, and therefore it says not only do you, you don't prevent him, there's a Me'iri that says you even encourage him and you, can, um, you should be teaching him the Torah. Um, because especially the mirror explain, explains that by a, a Christian, an ex-Christian, let's use a Christian, let's say a Christian, it's not ex-Christian yet. He believes the scriptures from God. And if he comes to you, you can't do any more damage. He's already damaged good, okay? <laughs> so basically, you're going to teach him the correct way to understand the Torah. So he's only going to come out, hopefully, on the other end, a better person, because he's going to have some insight. There's no way to understand the Torah without having proper instruction. So with all that said and done, with all the prophecies that we spoke about, and with all the direction that God wants the world to go in, so I would suggest to study, 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 start, start with the seven, right? Start with understanding the depth of the seven. Then you start to go deeper and deeper. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, uh just exactly in line with what you're saying, at the beginning of that paragraph that you spoke about in Brit Shalom, um, it said something about the one that had removed the yoke off of his shoulders, and it was a specific yoke? Oh, so that referred to the idea of what we spoke about in the laws of Shemitah. We're talking about someone who pushes off work, who pushes off being involved in taking government money. Whatever it is, you are non-dependent the floor and eat bread dipped in salt okay you're willing to forgo the luxuries of life that that's what it means like a levy like the Kohen does not have let's say the infrastructure to become wealthy therefore they're forced or they should be willing to be involved in chinuch in teaching okay and they will be taken care of okay they're not going to go around door to door asking for money so they can learn torah that's not what we're talking about we're talking about having a rich father-in-law we're talking about going into business and making making a killing and then going into teaching or just reducing your level of either comfort or luxuries to the point where you can work a few hours a day and teach the rest okay that's the idea of removing the yoke Thanks for clarifying that. I hope that uh, uh, I, I see that fit right in. 
Well, uh, Rabbi, we're we're only at an hour and fifteen minutes. I mean, so you know, feel free to keep going. Um, if anybody else online uh, on YouTube, Facebook, have any questions, feel free to type them in now, and I'll try and get them to the rabbi. But yeah, Rabbi, it's your your yeah. Go ahead. I I would like to hear some questions because there is something I'm thinking about. I'm just looking for the source. In the meantime, if there are any questions you would like to um, add, uh, read. A lot of comments here today, Rabbi. A lot of comments. No specific hardcore questions. There was a couple earlier. Uh, Veronica was talking about the difference between the subcategories and category or, or, and laws. Um, okay, so let me. If you have time, I want to go through something that I I found extremely mind boggling. All right. Okay, let's open up to Deuteronomy chapter 27. We could spend more time on this another time. Let me just introduce you to what's going on here. Okay, so in chapter 27 in Deuteronomy, there is, uh, I'm going to call it, it's prophetic, but it, it's God's command to what's going to happen when they go into the land of Israel. So they're going to inscribe something on stone. What are the, what's going to be inscribed on the stone? So let's start uh, with the first verse. Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Observe the entire commandment that I command you this day. It shall be on the day that you cross the Jordan to land that Hashem, your God, gives you. You shall set up these great stones, and you shall cover them with plaster. First of all, when you read the book of Joshua, this does not seem to happen on day one that they crossed over. But I do want to tell you that in chapter 4 and chapter 8, when you read the comments, that it did happen. Before they went to Jericho, they, before they had the war with Ai, the first thing they did was they went to the mountain and set up these stones covered in plaster, which we'll talk about. But they had the blessings and the curses on the mountains, and then they slept that night in Gilgal, meaning they traveled, I think, like 60 miles in one day, which was miraculous, and they carried these stones with them from the, from the Jordan River up to um, where they had this altar in, um, by the mountain, uh, Avel and uh, Grizim. And they took them again and put them in Gilgal, all in one 24-hour period. They slept there. What was written on these stones, and why is it important? So going back to the verse. It shall be on the day that you cross the Jordan to the land that the Shem your God gives you. You shall set up these great stones, and you shall coat them with plaster. You shall inscribe on them all the words of this Torah. What Torah are we talking about? Why is it so important to set up in the land of Israel by the border in Gilgal, where they're actually till this very day, wherever they may be? But why is it important? What's written on them? It says you shall inscribe all the words of this Torah. When you cross over so that you may enter the land that Hashem your God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, da, 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 it shall be, okay, number four, it shall be that when you cross the Jordan, you shall erect these stones which I command you this day, on Mount Evo, and you shall coat them with plaster. There you shall build the altar of Hashem, the altar of stones, you shall not raise iron. The whole stones, of whole stones, you shall build the altar of Hashem, your God, and you shall bring the offerings on them. Fine. Verse 8. You shall inscribe on the stones all the words of this Torah. Again, why do you need to tell me that? Well clarified. What does that mean? Bear heitev. Bear heitev means well clarified. The Torah, okay, you have to be like sitting down for this. Well clarified means in every language, 70 languages. The whole Torah, miraculously, these must have been big stones and they must have been writing very small. There's an opinion, let me find it. Do I have it here? Um, Okay, I don't have, I don't, oh yeah, it's right here. So there's different opinions. Uh, actually, I don't have it here, but 
And some say it was only the Ten Commandments, but it was all 70 languages. Some say it was uh, the entire Torah. Okay, but at the bottom there was another verse. I don't have the verse in front of me, but it says, "Do not allow the non the non the, the non Jewish nations have an influence on you towards their idolatry practices." So no matter what was written there, whether it was the Ten Commandments or whether it was the whole Torah, it was written in all seventy languages, and underneath was a one like like prominent verse that was like the point of the whole thing. That the non the non Jews who want to come to the land and live amongst the Jews have to become familiar with the Torah, whether it's the Ten Commandments. Remember, the Ten Commandments have six hundred and twenty letters. There's six hundred and thirteen for the six thirteen commandments, plus seven for the seven Nochai laws, or the entire Torah. The bottom line is that the Gentiles coming should be able to learn the Torah. Again, the written Torah. Everyone agrees they can learn the written Torah? It's right here, black and white. Why would you need to write it in 70 languages? Hello? Uh, the Jews only spoke Hebrew. They just came from Egypt. Maybe they spoke a little bit of Egyptian, a little bit of Yiddish. That's a joke. So there is an opinion that it's so that the Jews actually, when we go out to exile, we would be able to tune in uh, spiritually to the different languages and be able to transmit the Torah to the nations as well. That's one opinion. But the main opinion is that any non-Jew coming should understand they're not supposed to influence the Jew, but the Jew is supposed to influence them, and they should learn from what is written down. Why was it plastered over? The whole idea was any non-Jew that wants to come and learn, they would inscribe or however, you know, you take a piece of paper and you can take a pencil and you could, you know, if it's, um, it would show up on the paper. Basically, there was a certain method to the plaster that you would be able to read what's there and take it back back in other words the way of sharing the Torah with the world this was this was um a key in, in in respect to having the torah being disseminated amongst the nations whether they came to you to learn or in the end god forbid if we ever had to go to exile we would be able to carry the torah in the 70 languages okay i don't know if you ever heard that before but this is an amazing piece that I think um, uh, yeah, it, gets some light on it, To be commanded to put that there too, right? And, and, and the sheer fact, it just plays into unity, unity over, over millennia, over millennia. I mean, it's not just, oh, yeah. And, you know, the sages must have chewed it back and forth and forward and backward. But the reality is the notion stands and the purpose behind that. Well, Rabbi, I mean, a couple of people have kind of put some questions. I mean, nothing serious, uh, but, you know, because you were just mentioning about, you know, reading Torah. I uh, got uh, Fred out here has asked, you know, about uh, he has a Talmud and it's okay for him to read that. He wants to know it's it, it's okay that he can read that. Um, also, uh, GA down in California, uh, this may have been covered. They said because he stepped out for a bit. What are some examples of what additional Benani Noah cannot do, okay? Because you, you touched on today about 95, 98% of, of things that, hey, that might, that might very well be for you, and it's good for you to study, but um, could you just give a, a clear line of, hey, stay away from that. Don't even think about it. It's not for you. And I know there's many uh, in that couple percent that could be elaborated on, but can you give a clear example? Um, I'll tell you, one of the mitzvahs that are frowned upon, and that would be uh, the mitzvah of tefillin. Um, no, okay, there's a mitzvah to write your own Sefer Torah, right? So I don't think writing a Sefer Torah you shouldn't do uh, because you could get mixed up. If you, do, if you do a good enough job, people might think it was written by a Jew. Um, so maybe you want to write it in a way that is obviously not kosher. That could be a possibility. In terms of tefillin, anything that has like bears a certain amount of holiness and – was meant as an oath, a sign, also also Shabbos. So these are the, the let's use both of these examples. So to fill in would be something. It's called an oath. It's a sign. So that would be something to stay away from. I've heard about mezuzahs. It's best to put them on the inside of the door if a non-Jew wants to put. Someone even said put a number seven on there, so it's obvious that it, I don't know how pe people would notice such a small sign. But if you put them on the inside of your door as opposed to the outside of the door, that would probably be okay. 
um, in terms of Shabbos. So this is the big one, right? So I, you've heard me say this before, and I'll say it again. You have to do it kihalacha. If you want to do the mitzvahs, you have to do them properly. So since it's a not an obligatory mitzvah, it's maybe encouraged to celebrate Shabbat because there are two reasons for brought down, right? One is God created the world, and you're celebrating or you're acknowledging God, and that's a positive thing. But on the other hand, God says, there's a sign between just me and you. I, I took you out of the land of Egypt. So you were not taken out of the land of Egypt. So you're not obligated in the fullness in the fullness that a Jew is. So to observe, let's say, to celebrate Shabbat in a voluntary fashion, that's cool. That's great. But voluntary means to do something to show that you're doing it voluntarily, which means to break it. To break it in the sense of what a Jew would normally be considered breaking. So a non-Jew should rest, perhaps rest, perhaps take uh, some time off to meditate and to commune with Hashem and to have family, but not to observe it in the exact same way that a Jew does. And to show that is to perhaps joining uh, us live on uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, that's perhaps one way. Um, I can't really think of too many other examples at the moment. <clears throat> I'm um, sure there's plenty. Wearing seat seat, perhaps wearing seat seat inside. Oh, there's another. Remember, reading the Torah on your own, you will never get the right shot. Okay, you'll you'll be mistaken. So when it says, and you shall see them, so people think that means that I should wear them outside. I'm not doing it properly if I'm not wearing them outside. That's not the halacha at all. The halacha is the reason it says, and you shall see them is because it's a daytime mitzvah. That's all that it means. It doesn't mean that you shall see them, that you should see them. That you should see them means it's a daytime mitzvah. You only see during the day. So when you put them on, you see them, and then you can tuck them in. There's nothing wrong. You're fulfilling the mitzvah when you're wearing them, period. So if you want to do the mitzvah of tzitzit, so then my suggestion is to wear them inside, not to show them, because then people might say, oh, come, you'll be the 10th person, or Whatever, there's different ideas of, of being mixed up and confused by a uniform. So you don't need to um, to wear them outside to show anything because there's nothing to prove to anybody. This is between you and God. Okay? So that's keep in terms that in of mind. It. Yeah. So that's, yeah. B'nai Noah, got to keep that in mind. You're, yeah, this is not about being seen, uh, it's about your walk with Hashem. Uh, I do have another friend down in uh, San, or San Antonio area just asking, you know. Is it okay that he say a blessing before studying? I still think some of these B'nai Noach are having difficulty bouncing out of right and ritual uh, and staying alive. Like it's perfect. I think in my eyes, it's in my, my understanding is perfectly fine to say a blessing before studying. Um, so there, there are different blessings. There are different types of blessings, different categories of blessings. There are blessings that we do over mitzvot, and there are other blessings we do out of praise. So the ones out of praise, as far as I know, we have to look to each one perhaps, but they're certainly less problematic. There seems to be no problem at all for a non-Jew to make any blessings out of praise. That, right? Yeah. And we have to see if there are any maybe exceptions, but as far as I know, that should be um, fine. When it comes to a blessing for a mitzvah, so that's, that sounds like it's out of bounds to me, but again, there may be other opinions uh, to say, I share of a mitzvah. That I'm sanctifying myself through the commandments that God commanded me, is uh, is is not a truth. It's not a full truth. So right. maybe the sitter, there's a bnei noach sitter. Maybe there's a, a suggestion of how to word it. Okay, granting permission, perhaps, <laughs> to well, to be able to. Rab Rabbi Hirky, yeah, Rabbi Hirky, who wrote the Brit Shalom, uh, also has his 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 prayer book out there, um, but. You're one hundred percent on the mark with that. I, I appreciate you being clear. Uh yeah, so Okay. The, you 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 asked a question in the very beginning of the last series and I didn't get it. Do you remember? Uh off the top of my head, unfortunately no. I've done about four or five other broadcasts this week and uh um uh, forgive me, Rabbi, but all I can say is that that we appreciate the liveliness with which you're sharing, but more than the liveliness, this beyond the seven topic is, it's almost like a, an opening of uh, something that we as B'nai Noah 
don't get shown clearly often enough. And I'm not trying to put any shortfalls out there on other rabbis or anything of that nature. You're doing a wonderful job at shining clearly to myself and those that have been tuning in. I want you to feel feel uh, uh, you know confident and 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 know that you're blessing people and shining light. A lot of rabbis out there um, are coming all from their specific uh, position and sharing their strength. What you're sharing, I think, you know, is a very very carte blanche opens up for the world. You know, uh, like a, it's like a small light in in a dark place shines brightly, and what you're doing is shining very, very brightly. So I want to I want to thank you for that. And um, thank you for giving the opportunity. We're just past we're just past our ninety minute mark, so we may as well want to wind it down. Is there any final words you want to share, Rabbi? Before and are we okay for next week? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. There's Rat Hashem. Um, if people have questions they want to send you during the week, and you can send them to me in advance, so I can have perhaps a, a chance to look things over and uh, prepare them in, either into the lecture or um, have some time at the end to, to address them. That would be helpful. Um, I, do, I think I want to focus next week. Uh, there's a book called Path of the Just because oh, we spoke about it in the introduction last week, fear, fear of God. I, I mentioned fear of God is not what people think it is, okay? Uh, or maybe it is. I, I don't know what people think. But uh, there's lower levels. There's different levels. So one of the lower levels is a fear of sin, fear of punishment, or looking towards reward, doing positive things because we call it love. But there's something even greater than that, and that's called awe. We, we gave over a very uh, simple, simplified example of when you're in love with somebody like your wife and you want to tiptoe into a room late at night to grab something, you're not afraid she's going to throw the shoe at you, right? You're not trying to get any points by her. You really just don't want to disturb her. You don't want to hurt her. You don't want to uh, rob her of her sleep. So you're tiptoeing. That's called awe, right? And that may be a very um, juvenile example, but I want to focus on this because this is um, the, the chapter that's going to deal with the, the, the character trait of chassidut, of being a chassid, because as I understand I should say, uh, hopefully, that many of the B'nai Noach are, um, they want to be in the category of the pious of the nations. And it's okay if anybody here is this watching that just wants to be amongst the wise of the nations and be an atheist or being agnostic, if there, if such a thing could possibly exist after tonight's year, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I got no problem with that. In fact, I think that's praiseworthy that you don't want to steal and you don't want to rob and you don't want to hurt anybody. So Baruch Hashem for people like you, and I wish millions, millions, billions of people would be like you. Uh, but we want to try to take it to the next step. That's the idea of Beyond the Seven. So I, this is what we're going to do next week. So I hope you can all tune in. Anybody who watches it during the week should know that Bezrat Hashem this coming uh, Saturday night, we're going to deal with the idea of what, it, what, could, what does it mean to be a Hasid and to have uh, such a high level of awe, love, that's beyond fear, uh, or it's within fear, but it's, anyway, well, you'll have to tune in to hear what it's about. So that's what I want to do. <laughs> Rabbi, that's a wonderful job to whet our appetite for next week. Um, I want to thank you again for the, the wonderful lesson. Folks, please reach out to uh, uh, Rabbi Poston. You can find him on yubinay.com. You can find him uh, on Facebook or his YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to uh, write some questions, come up with some questions, think about some questions, Questions that he could maybe take some time to mull over ahead of time and prepare some uh, really good material. He's doing a wonderful job. We really are thankful that he's taking the time uh, because, let's face it, it's uh, after 1 a.m. in the morning in Jerusalem, and he's still sharing, and so I'm so grateful. So until next week, Hashem willing, we'll see you then. Hasidut. <laughs> Thank you.
Nie ma, nie ma, 